Good morning and welcome back to A Call to Transform Manila Museum Summit 2020, hosted by the Metropolitan Museum of Manila and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. In collaboration with the Alliance of Greater Manila Area Museums and with the support of our education partners, Museum Foundation of the Philippines and De La Salle University Publishing House. To open the final day of the summit, we would like to welcome architect Michael F. Manalo, the Commissioner for Cultural Heritage of the National Commission for Culture and Youth. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning to all of the, to the participants and to all of uh, the people tuned in on Facebook. Um, I, I don't know if it's, a, if it's a great thing for you. It's a second day Manalo has been opening the sessions. But um, kidding aside, I'm very honored to be with you all and to represent the Subcommission for Cultural Heritage of the National Commission for Culture and Arts um, uh, in opening uh, this last day of, uh, of the Metro Manila Museum Summit. Um, but what, what really got me excited with this invitation is really just to be with all of, um, all of my colleagues from the museum world. Um, what what uh, not a lot of people do know is that I did start my professional career in a museum um, in the office of uh, the exhibitions preparator. So we were the ones designing the exhibitions and I was there for one or two years. Um, and it's something that uh, really is very dear to me. And these are the fundamentals of my career. Um, and I know that a lot of us would agree uh, when I say that you don't forget where you come from. So that forms the center, that forms the core. And this brings me to a short recap of yesterday's discussions um, that revolved uh, maybe around the pandemic and how we are all reacting to it, how we are all adjusting to the pandemic. But what's nice is that what also came out is, uh, in the discussions was that we, we realized that our center re still remains in, in our archives, in our collections, you know? uh, and in all of these things that make us what, uh, what we are as museums, but they also revolve around our communities. And the, the nice thing about it is that um, I've been tuning into all of the sessions uh, from Facebook for the past three days. And um, I've, I've been seeing uh, people tuning in from various parts of the country. And the reach of, uh, of, of this digital platform is amazing. It's immense. Uh, I, I saw people from Mindanao, from, from the Visayas, and a lot of people from Luzon. So I think this is the bright spot. I think this is really the bright spot that us as a museum community, we, we are reaching out to build bridges to other museums, big and small, but also creating audiences through our digital platforms, which, which is a fantastic thing. Um, in, in my discussion points today, it's, it's, it's great. Um, I thank the Secretariat for, for having prepared them. There was a question at the very end uh, that I'm supposed to ask you. Uh, I'm supposed to ask you, why do we do the things that we do as museums? So we're, we're not supposed to really ask, uh, we're not supposed to answer that. We're just supposed to ponder on it. But for me, we're just supposed to act on it. Um, we, we don't have to think of the answer. We just have to live the answer. We just have to act on that answer, right? Um, so. Once again, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to be able to open the last session of the Metro Manila Museum Summit. Um, thank you so much to Agbam. Thanks so much to, to the Metropolitan Museum for hosting. And now I turn you to uh, Ms. Tina Kolaiko uh, to give um, the introduction to our uh, keynote speaker for today. Tina? Thank you, Architect Manalo, for opening day four of the Manila Museum Summit 2020, and for setting a wonderful tone for our last day in your welcome remarks. Let me now introduce our keynote speaker for today. She is the visionary behind many cultural projects that take pride in our heritage as a nation. Deputy Speaker Lauren Legarda currently serves as a member of the House of Representatives of the Philippines, representing the Lone District of the Province of Antique and was the three-term Senator of the Philippine Senate. Deputy Speaker Legarda has long been an advocate of cultural preservation, supporting the program, Schools of Living Traditions, and creating the country's first permanent textile gallery 
Hiblan ng Lahing Pilipino at the National Museum, as well as supporting the establishment of Likaan in Intramuros, a repository for the country's traditional arts. It was also through her vision and leadership that the Philippines is now actively participating in the Venice Biennale, one of the world's oldest and most prestigious art exhibitions. She has also been instrumental in the establishment of the Philippine Contemporary Art Network, a platform for research, exhibition, curatorial exchange, and public engagement. She conceptualized Dayao, a documentary on Philippine arts and culture, now on its eighth season, and has also supported Buhay na Buhay, a series on the study of former National Commission for Culture and Arts, Felipe de Leon, on the eight endemic cultures. For her efforts, Deputy Secretary Lagarda received the Dangal ng Haraya, Patron of Arts and Culture Award from the NCCA. Let us now all welcome Deputy Speaker Lauren Legarda. Thank you very much, Tina, and uh, good morning to all of you. I, I missed all of you, and I wish that we could see each other in person very, very soon. Allow me to thank um, the organizers, especially my dear friend, Tina Kolaiko, and your very efficient and hardworking staff of the Metropolitan Museum, the brilliant uh, minds of the art world who have generously shared their expertise for the past few days and actually months in preparing for this. I'm honored to be here amidst experts who have excelled in their respective um, fields. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic, which has taken us all by surprise, has caused substantial economic and social impact on the art sector, the whole economy, affecting the operations of most, if not all, organizations, leading to the cancellation of events, physical closing of museums, even the postponement of many projects or slowing down of the economy in general. We've been used to such a way of life that such disruption has led us to rethink the importance of such activities in our social and mental well being. Though art and cultural workers are adept and creative and adaptive in finding ways to cope, the sector deemed by some as non essential, although we know it's not true, is particularly under pressure and extremely vulnerable to the resulting uncertainties brought about with the current crisis. A July 2020 impact and response tracker special issue released by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization or UNESCO has noted that, and I quote, the true economic weight of the cultural creative sector and the effects of the pandemic on the same. The report cited the following statistics and I quote, 13% of museums sadly might never reopen. 95% of the estimated 95,000 museums worldwide were closed in May due to COVID-19. 60 to 80% international arrivals for 2020 were reduced. And it is predicted that up to 75 million jobs in the travel and tourism sector are under immediate threat, equating to a loss of 2.1 trillion US dollars in 2020. Just looking at these facts and figures worldwide, we can see that the arts and culture sector have been adversely affected by the pandemic. I've always been very supportive of projects and programs that promote arts and culture. As Tina mentioned in 2015, and now in its ninth season, Dayao, this television documentary series on Philippine indigenous culture, which we collaborate with, with the NCCA and the ANC, has evolved into 
an invaluable resource on Philippine culture that has been made available to the public. It airs on ANC. It is uploaded in the NCCA YouTube and Facebook channel and in mine as well. There is also Buhay na Buhay, another documentary series that takes a look at the multicultural dynamics of Filipinos. The show is based on the study of then NCCA Chair Felipe de Leon Jr. on the eight living cultures of the Philippines, namely Pagdidiwata, Harmony with the Deities, Pag-uukir, Poetic Mysticism, Pamamanata, Devotion to the Patron Saint, Pananahan, Devotion to the Home and Family, Paglilining, Reflection and Reasoning, Pagpropotesta, Culture of Social Criticism, Concern and Protest, Pag-aaliw, Culture of Entertainment, Pagkabansa, Devotion to the Nation and Being a Filipino. We are always in pursuit of deepening our understanding of the very soul and identity of being Filipino. To this show, we witness how our culture continues to be very much alive. Buhay na buhay. In August 2019, we also launched Likhaan in Puerto Real, in Intramuros, which serves as a space, a creative resource center to learn alternative modes of learning through workshops and lectures and demonstrations on our Philippine living traditions. And there you see our still alive Gamaba awardees with us, including Magdalena Gamayo, all the way from Pinili. So much of the traditions, arts, and crafts of our indigenous people are vanishing with the older generation. To help preserve and continue this unique and rich heritage, we began the development of cultural villages of the Atamanobo, the Mandaya, Balaan, Bagobo Tagbanwa, the Yakan village in Zamboanga City, focusing on their schools of living traditions or SLPs. And this became a vital step towards nurturing and mentoring the artistic culture of the younger generation. So that was our work and continues, the work continues with the NCCA, not just to document our schools of living tradition, but also to allow the mentoring by the older generation to the younger ones, not just of weaving, but even other intangible heritage like song, dance, rituals, and many more. Now to support and promote Philippine contemporary art, the PICAN, Philippine Contemporary Art Network, was launched in 2018 at the University of the Philippines Vargas Museum, which seeks to activate a network to coordinate a range of interventions in contemporary art in the Philippines. A brainchild of my dear friend Patrick Flores, which I immediately embraced and supported and collaborated with. Since its inaugural in 2017, I'm happy to note that PICAN has already organized two exhibitions, two curatorial workshops in partnership with the Japan Foundation, and has launched four groundbreaking publications. A fifth publication on the anthology of Philippine art is set to be released soon. I've also supported the conduct of a curatorial intensive in 2016 in partnership with the Independent Curators International and TINA of the Metropolitan Museum, where we had Philippine curators, not just based in Manila, but all over the Philippines and globally to join this curatorial intensive. I think it's safe to say that uh, at no time in the history of our country have both uh, traditional art and contemporary art been so supported considering the limited um, resources of government. But I am so glad to report that 
in the past several years, I've closely collaborated with colleagues in the art and culture arena, uh, Tina and Patrick and many more, to showcase the artistry of the Filipino contemporary artists to the world. As you all know, Tina mentioned this, I initiated, despite all odds, and that's another story, the return of the Philippines to the Venice Art Biennale in 2015, but the work started in 2012 or 13 with the proposal, Tie a String Around the World, curated by Dr. Patrick Flores, featuring the works of Bogi, Jose Tense Ruiz, Mani Mantolibano, Manuel Conde, and Carlos Francisco as artists. It was followed in 2016 with the first ever participation of the Philippines in the Architecture Biennale in Venice, housed at then the European Cultural Center Palazzo Mora in Venice, which featured the exhibition of Muhon, Traces of an Adolescent City, curated by the team of architect Leandro Luxin, Sudarshan Kadka, Juan Paulo de la Cruz of Leandro Luxin Partners. The 2017 participation of the Philippines in the Venice Biennale was also historic, as a national pavilion was housed for the first time in the Artigliere of the Arsenale, one of the main exhibition spaces of the Venice Biennale featuring the curatorial concept of Yeye, Rosalina Cruz, Spectre of Comparison, which brought together acclaimed international artists, Lani Maestro and Manuelo Campo. Again, this was a dream inconceivable, totally unbelievable. Many people thought I was crazy when I declared that we will be here. And yes, we're still there, hopefully even if I'm no longer in charge of funding this. The Philippine participation was sustained yearly as it showcased the curatorial concept of Dr. Edson Cabalfin in 2018, titled The City of Two Navels, the curatorial concept of Tessa Maria Guazon, titled Island Weather, with artist Marco Stignani in 2019, and the curatorial proposal titled Structures of Mutual Support, by architect Sudarshan Vikadka Jr. and architect Alexander Erickson Purunes in the 17th International Exhibition of La Biennale di Venezia, rescheduled, obviously, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, to 2021. To support our local artisans, we spearheaded the launch of the National Arts and Crafts Fair, a collaboration with the Department of Trade and Industry, which has been held since 2016 at the Megatrade. The fair highlighted both contemporary arts and crafts that exemplify indigenous living traditions through handmade products, ornaments, jewelry, fabric, accessories. An average of 120 groups and individuals from different regions showcased their arts and crafts. The three-day fair featured workshops, demonstrations on abaca weaving, Pina embroidery, leather crafting, paper art, jewelry making, and contemporary and traditional and experimental dance and musical performances. It was not just having stalls and selling stuff, which is good enough because we allow to give them income and livelihood, but we also had lectures and workshops and dance to educate those who are purchasing the goods of our IPs. These are just some of the many initiatives we've been promoting for the sector that has been so close to my heart, the arts. I believe that this sector has an important role in binding us Filipinos together. A piece of artwork alone makes a great emotional impact to its viewers. In this time of pandemic, we bring ourselves back to art as we open the books that we've so long stored and kept away. We uh, watch performance that were streamed online, listen to music as we spend each day um, working from home and still in quarantine sometimes and engage ourselves in virtual tours offered by museums as we did with Patrick for Vargas. 
and I hope many more museums and all have their virtual tours online as a way to cope with a mental and emotional toll that the pandemic has also brought forth. During this pandemic, we were all given an opportunity to reevaluate our priorities. In the arts sector, the government, particularly Congress, has had to reassess how assistance can be extended to the sector and stakeholders. That is why, as chair of the House Subcommittee on Better Normal and sponsor of House Bill 6864, or the Better Normal for the Workplace, Communities, and Public Spaces Act of 2020, we have this proposed measure passed on third reading in the House, but still pending in the Senate. And I saw to it that the art and culture sectors were addressed in the proposed law that was originally meant to institutionalize only health and safety protocols. But because of this, I included some provisions, which I may mention now, that the government provides sufficient support for culture betters and masters and those engaged in crafts making, such as weaving and carving, that emergency cash subsidies be given to artists, cultural workers, freelancers, and the self-employed, such as those working in the audiovisual, entertainment, and live events sector, and other creative industries, such as architecture and allied arts, dance, dramatic arts, literary arts, music, visual arts, contemporary arts or expressions, audiovisual and multimedia, and scholars, critics, curators, and cultural workers. Third, the stakeholders are able to maximize the use of digital platforms so that they are able to consolidate the resources and other cultural forms in public spaces to create an archive of oral histories, visual ethnographies, philosophical discourse, and technical and creative capacity building program geared towards bolstering various creative industries. Fourth, that the proposed measure highly encourages online promotion or streaming of cultural programs, performances, exhibitions, and enhancement of existing public arts and monuments. House Bill 6864 has been passed on by the House of Representatives, as I mentioned, passed on third reading, and is now pending in the Senate. Earlier on, I filed other bills to give stronger legislative support to the arts sector, which has always been a priority. House Bill 638, an act institutionalizing Philippine participation in the international exhibitions of the Venice Biennale, which recognizes the important role of the arts in fostering patriotism and nationalism, and the vital role of culture and the arts in democratic and inclusive nation building. This measure has already been passed on third reading in the House of Representatives, still pending in the Senate. Meanwhile, as the Biennale activities have also been put on hold, we assure you that the Philippines will still continue to take its place in the Venice Biennale. And fortunately, the funds I allocated as Senator Chair of the Finance Committee may be sufficient for us to stage our participation in 2021. I've also filed a bill that seeks to establish a Department of Culture, which shall be responsible for the protection, preservation, promotion of arts and culture in the country. Now more than ever, we are becoming more cognizant of the value of art amid this time of confinement and isolation. It is our social lifeline that gives us the sense of belonging and identity. Our artistic and cultural practices and beliefs transform us into passionate and patriotic individuals that we should be. Lastly, I note the importance of our museums whose presence are considered a locus for interaction, which provides room for discourse for stakeholders to interact, ruminate, critique, simply enjoy. Museums represent the life of the community. It integrates the community to its creative quality, its history and society that nurture these creative forms, a place where people can reflect their sense of being and becoming. I note, that for the past days, discussions centered 
on how the art sector has been faring amid the pandemic. And I certainly learned and will continue to learn from all of you. This pandemic has reminded us that despite the challenges, we learn to adapt. Just like my other advocacy on climate change adaptation, we in the arts and culture center learn to adapt. We learn to listen. We learn to become resilient. And through a can-do attitude and an environment that fosters collective support, and understanding, I'm confident that the sector will persevere and outlive the pandemic in the many, many years to come. And so I appreciate having the opportunity to tell you about the work that we in government have been doing for the past several years, at least a decade of support to both traditional art and contemporary art. I support the initiatives you are doing, and I hope all the best for this Manila Museums Summit. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Speaker Legarda, for championing so many cultural programs and initiatives, including legislation to support the art and cultural sector all these years, and most especially during these dire and trying times. We welcome your sponsorship and the inclusion of support for cultural workers, freelancers, and the self-employed in your Better Normal Bill, which we hope will get passed soon. We are very appreciative of your raising the acute need of a national cultural policy in a ministry that will promote the development of culture and the arts and the protection of our art and cultural heritage. Thank you very much again. As part of a conference program, participating museums and colleagues in the academe gathered yesterday to continue discussions that began with the presentations and the Q&As from the last three days of the conference. The chairs of the breakout sessions from yesterday are with us this morning to share the interesting outcome of their discussions. And the chair of the first group is architect Jerry Torres, who is a tenured professor at the De La Salle College of St. Benilde, and who is also the director and curator for Benilde's Center of Campus Art. Jerry served as Benilde's Dean of the School of Design and Arts in 2004 and 2010, where he founded four degree programs, architecture, photography, animation, and digital film. Jerry holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of Santo Tomas, a graduate diploma in interior design from the Queensland University of Technology, Brisbane, Australia, and a master's degree in design and art education from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, where he also taught handling and handled design courses at the UNSW and at the KVB Institute of Technology. Might I mention, he also was the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Manila in 2011 and 2012. Jerry is the principal architect of Jerry Torres Architectural Design, established in 2010. Architect Jerry Torres, may we hear from you? Hi, Pina. Good morning. And uh, thank you for that introduction. So um, we were able to uh, gather last October 29 for the first FGD uh, with a the theme museums in flux, in particular, focusing on the talks of uh, Dr. Patrick Flores and Dr. Eugene Tan. Um, and uh, it was a good mix of, uh, it's a good mix of um, attendees. We had independent curators, directors, museum works, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, museum workers from university museums, uh, especially. Uh, before the discussion, one comment was shared that it was a comforting feeling to realize that whether we are from big or small museums, we are all together in the same situation. Uh, and that gave rise to a certain level of generosity among the group members to uh, share their ideas, help each other, and uh, uh, also support uh, in terms of uh, collaborations in the future that was one of the, the plans. 
Uh, in general, the response to the pandemic of the group recognized the need for flexibility and multifunctionality. And uh, especially in uh, the digital realm, that was the, the uh, main area of discussion, the, the fact that we've all migrated to the digital, uh, the digital space. So certain points were raised that uh, digital media is now recognized as an important player and a constant um, material uh, for our museums moving forward. Digital works uh, are seen as uh, possibly can engage more the audience during these times and in the future because of the very nature of its accessibility and that uh, digital learnings uh, and practices uh, that has happened in the pandemic can and should be integrated in the new normal of our future operations. Uh, also that the expansion of the digital landscape and the availability of digital content can help smaller galleries get more engagement and develop their audience. Uh, in terms of formats, uh, video has uh, was identified as a as the best uh, form for uh, digital content uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, of available technology, the mobile apps uh, was also seen as another avenue that uh, smaller museums can explore. Uh, but I think also in the bigger museums, uh, for us to be able to share our content and also to be more accessible to our audience. However, there were also some uh, you know like warnings. Digital exhibitions are not the only solutions, and it may it will not totally replace the physical exhibits and installations that we do. There was a comment that sometimes digital platforms cheapen the overall experience of art, especially if the technology is a bit clumsy. Uh, we recognize that the audience, the young audience, are uh, digital natives or are have very high level of uh, preferences when it comes to digital content. Uh, so digital walkthroughs that we've seen are not always effective and also that digital content is not uh, always uh, a good thing. In terms of new programming and curation, uh, uh, there were suggestions of reintroducing content from previous shows, but perhaps um, let it be engaged uh, by a new group of artists uh, or uh, designers to come up with new content. And then also cluster of smaller operations like uh, pop-up shows, correspondence shows and outdoor exhibits were also suggested. Um, and then uh, conversations and collaborations with new artists to uh, produce new work as well as uh, print media. Uh, can be explored as supplement to the digital shows. Uh, I mean, as a natural progression from the digital, the print uh, material can uh, be seen as a, as a good uh, project for us to undertake. There was also a warning for us to avoid a hodgepodge of content when we do our uh, curatorial uh, strategies. Uh, and that needs to be also thought out well. Uh, we go to the audience. The museum spaces has now been uh, seen, uh, the pandemic has engendered a museum spaces. So a possible wider audience that's afforded by the, by the digital landscape. And uh, two of these have been identified, parents, uh, especially those who are at home teaching their children. And I'd also like to add, of course, the kids and the OFWs were identified as potential new audience. Uh, there's also a uh, sort of warning that we should know our audience and their expectations, especially the younger set. As I mentioned earlier, the technology that we employ uh, is going to be seen and used by um, a younger generation who have uh, high levels of, of quality when it comes to the digital content that they are used to. Uh, the archives, our archives are seen, uh, has been identified as uh, potential sources of materials, especially for those museums who may not have had the opportunity or the means to uh, archive their previous works. Uh, 
um, so the archives are seen as potential source materials, but also this is an opportunity for us to uh, start archiving, uh, and, uh, do housekeeping, uh, and, and explore the archives as potential content uh, for uh, the next few months or even years. Uh, and as I repeat, during the pandemic, housekeeping can be performed. Uh, these are tasks that perhaps uh, our museums have not been able to do because of our very hectic uh, schedules. So manage a collection, storage, conservation, and inventory. And, and this can also be directed for digital content creation. Uh, the democratization of the museum is also was also brought up. So the expansion of the physical space to the digital landscape, uh, of course, opens uh, many possibilities. We've also seen the advantages of the digital because now we go beyond the limits of time and space. Uh, also exploring methods in bringing, sorry, that's a type, we're bringing the museum outdoors. Uh, some examples have been mobile museums, um, also exploring an orthodox spaces uh, in the city or in the vicinity of the museum, like empty lots, old buildings, even beaches, uh, and forests. Um, there's also uh, the concerns that have been that were raised were the struggle with the transition to the digital landscape. What about problems like uh, unavailable? resources in technology, hardware, uh, software, and the skill sets among the staff, uh, not to mention uh, those museums whose staff were reduced due to the pandemic. Uh, in the case of university museums, students were seen as uh, potential help uh, in terms of uh, trans moving to the digital landscape. But then again, uh, one of the administrators pointed out that our students are all working from home uh, and also doing their classes. Uh, it doesn't mean that if they're, all, they're working from home, they're not uh, engaged in classes. So that was also brought up as a potential concern. Um, the traffic of uh, digital content today, like talks, symposia, other online events by museums, there was a suggestion of perhaps having a collated calendar that can... Uh, manage um, overlaps in schedules and programs for digital offerings uh, like webinars and talks. Uh, so maybe Agmam uh, can talk to the member museums. Uh, this is coming from somebody who uh, wants to attend all of the <laughs> digital offerings that the museums offer nowadays. Uh, also what was raised was the need of uh, depth ed uh, for uh, better cultural materials for education. They say that it's urgently needed and that perhaps the museums can help. And the last one was a proposal to increase the allowed guests of 50% for GCQ areas. This is for our museums. And 75 to perhaps 100% for MGCQ. Uh, of course, uh, recognizing that safety measures still have to be put in place, but also with a plea that we need to open uh, in some way uh, very soon. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. For the presentation. And uh, the welcome recommendations. We would also like to thank the participants of the focus group discussion of Jerry, who contributed to the ideas to the dialogue. And now we go to the second group, the response of which will be given by Ms. Victoria Boots Herrera, who joined the Ateneo Art Gallery as its director and chief curator in May 2015. This was preceded by her post as Director of the Cultural Center of the Philippines Visual Arts and Museum Division, Production, Exhibition Department. 
She was then seconded from the University of the Philippines Diliman where she was the regular faculty for more than 20 years at the Department of Arts Studies. She also lectures for the BFA in Arts Management program at the Ateneo de Manila University where she teaches curatorship, collections management and other museum related concerns. She co-authored the book, The Life and Art of Leah Guinaldo in 2011, it, that won the Alfonso Ongpin Best Award, Best Book on Art Prize for the Life and Art of Leah Guinaldo. She is the member of the Alliance of Greater Manila Area Museums, the International Council of Museum ICOM, and the International Committee of Modern Art Museums, CMAM. Ms. Boots. Maybe Hi, Tina. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning to everyone. Um, it was a pleasure uh, moderating the, the FGD uh, session yesterday for the second uh, group. So the, the theme of that particular um, of our discussion uh, revolved around the topic of facing an inevitable change um, and just Recap uh, some highlights from the presentations of day two, uh, from which we we um, revolved our our discussion around. Um, so the keynote speaker focused on the responsive the civic responsibility of museums and cultural institutions, um, whether they're privately or publicly funded. Um, so recognizing our responsibility to our community of artists and different audiences. Um, I, I thought of linking this to the notion of the museum as a public trust, uh, which we are all uh, a part of, most of us anyway, underscoring our duty of care, loyalty, and obedience, and the importance of ethics in museum and curatorial practice, if we are to seriously work towards professionalizing our field. Um, the names of the two panel panelists, uh, Ms. Zoe Bott and Ritia Gawiwong, uh, generally focus on addressing the gaps between the museum and the artist and their audiences um, and enhancing networking and collaboration with and among communities. So the highlights of our discussion, um, our group was actually composed of um, representatives from museums, um, a number of um, three university museums were, that were actually represented, apart from the Atene Art Gallery, the Vargas Museum, and the Aga Khan Museum uh, of the Mindanao State University. Uh, we also have uh, had a representative from the Nayang Pilipino Foundation, um, galleries um, from Silverlands and, and Canvas, um, and educators from the College of St. Denis, as well as a um, a represent an archivist from the House of Representatives archives. Or just a profile of our uh, group yesterday. So the highlights of our discussion. Um, it, it started with with focusing on um, on, on the question of how um, education can can be further enhanced by the resources of our museums. So um, to summarize that point. Um, we we felt that there is a um, there, there is more need for a meaningful interface consultation and collaboration between school educators and museums beyond exhibitions, what is on site or vir virtual, uh, by carving out a space for culture in traditional and non traditional education formats. Um, to, to um, operate, operationalize this, uh, it's important to strengthen the integration of art and creative practices in the development of educational resources. So there is a, a felt, um, this, this uh, lockdown has actually uh, forced or led, not really forced, but led many of us to, to um, actively collaborate, reach out to educators, and it has produced very, um, um, substantial results um, in developing our education program. So it's not just about producing modules, but first knowing who, um, um, designing it for which particular age group, which subject area. So there was a, um, and this I'm taking it from 
um, the experience of Ateneo Art Gallery where we um, actively reached out to subject area teachers on how we could um, uh, help develop resources for their online classes. A uh, relation theme topic uh, concern, um, the question was posed, how are textbooks and online modules developed? Um, so the, the idea of museums being uh, having a more um, meaningful um, participation in developing content, no, not uh, art, not just as visual aids, but but really as a as a form of um, uh, no, uh, for a particular um, particular topic. Like, like for example, um, this is based by um, Isa Lorenzo of Silver Lens. Uh, contemporary artists reveal deep sensitivities and concern for everyday life and can explain current global issues. So uh, this is something that educators can also take on um, as part of their um, uh, module development. And museums and curators can be um, a mediator towards this objective. So there needs to be a more collaborative approach to curatorial practice uh, that is conscious of nuances of artistic processes which is key to, to achieve this objective. It was also raised that um, there may be copyright concerns and issues. So how can fair use be applied to educational materials that may be for sale online or whether they're in printed format? So there needs to be a balance between protecting the rights of the artists and enhancing the educational value of uh, learning materials. Um, I think this, Issue, this point was also raised by our keynote speaker la yesterday. You know, uh, Dave. So uh, another point that was raised was uh, the development of programs in hybrid formats, uh, digital and printed. Uh, but also government needs to ensure that effective infrastructure is better uh, for better interconnectivity access provided. Um, just like right now, my, my internet um, connection is unstable. So uh, there are also programs where museums, these are also programs where museums can employ the services of creatives who are mostly freelance practitioners. So it's not just about commissioning artworks, but involving uh, the creative practitioners, um, artists, designers in designing educational and promotional programs. Um, beyond developing content, um, museum Museums, cultural institutions, and the government also need to invest resources on visitor experience studies. Um, one of the members of the group um, raised the issue of we uh, we do not have the the capacity or infrastructure or or um, uh, designed studies to be able to gauge the effectivity of our program like example our educational module so um, we believe this is something that needs to be addressed and developed further to understand the levels of engagement and extent of engagement so uh, study and analysis of ex audience experience are worth pursuing at the regional um, and national levels so in line again with the civic role of museums discussion also revolved around the service museums give back to the community. Um, so it's not only about not, not being not for profit, but also understanding the cultural and social value our institutions provide to the community. Um, one interesting, uh, there were a couple of interesting um, suggestions, which I think um, are doable and, and can be um, managed by a group like AGMA uh, or NCOM, um, creation portals that will cons consolidate museum um, access to museum education resources and also museum shops. Um, this was actually raised by our colleague from Aga Khan Museum um, for the museum shop. So I think it, it's, and we thought it was a very good suggestion um, 
for the, all of our museum merchandise having um, being incorporated through links, no, um, in a in a portal which will allow um, our audiences from different parts of the country or even around the world to be able to 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 um, see what we have. Uh, so this is actually a very important um, assistance uh, that can be provided, whether um, museums are large or small. Um, and of course, it helps generate income. Uh, the museum education resources, again, uh, it's similar to Cherry Raised, how um, um, it's important to manage um, access to training programs. Um, it's also important to, to uh, inform um, our educators, uh, teachers, what, are avail um, what resources are available for them to use. And um, lastly, um, we all agree, of course, that museums and art are essential. And similarly to how Jerry uh, ended his presentation, we also believe that um, museums should be allowed uh, to open soon, sooner rather than later. Um, I, I'd like to, to uh, refer to a colleague who, um, Ambeto Campo is the one who raised this question, if halls are already allowed to open at limited capacity, why not museums? Um, we actually have um, the capability to manage traffic um, and um, observe strict health guidelines. And so with that, um, I end the presentation and thank you. Thank you very much, Boots, and the particip participants of your discussion group. We note the valuable role of museums and government and all the stakeholders and partners to invest in educational infrastructure, content, and platforms for broader engagement of audiences. Thank you again. The third discussion group that we will now hear from was chaired by Ms. Rika Estrada, who is the officer in charge of the Cultural Center of the Philippines Visual Arts and Museums Division. She is currently the Vice President of the Alliance of Greater Manila Area Museums. Her museum practice runs parallel to her roots in indep independent initiatives and art management for startups in the arts and culture field. To present the findings from our focus group on adaptive design and responsive solutions, Please welcome Ms. Rika Estrada. Good morning, everyone. Um, like, thank you for um, the Metropolitan Museum and, and of course, Admon for creating this uh, museum summit. Uh, every, I think what the first common thing that we talked about in our FGD was how beneficial um, it was for everyone to attend and, and learn from all of the, the speakers and, and activities. Um, so our um, FGD group was assigned to um, the topic adaptive design and responsive solutions. So we had a group of around 15 museums in the group, museums and um, uh, other institutions as well. So one of the um, things that were that, that sort of or centered our ideas was the idea of what do we have? Um, what are our current capacities? So what our first key takeaway was to maximize available resources, um, to collaborate um, among the personnel of the museum, um, even interns, volunteers, um, for example, uh, this was done in, in museums like uh, Ayala Museum and Vargas Museum. Also to um, collaborate with other inter internal arms of the institution, um, other, other offices, other divisions. And then also to um, maximize the resource of the community that you're in. So for example, for the university museum, um, the faculty, uh, the student body, um, and then, of course, your your own your own museum staff. So it's um, some examples or some projects that 
that um, were along these lines were like uh, projects by the Presidential Car Museum and of course um, the Maritime Museum also um, and the College of Home Economics Museum where they um, worked with their students um, as interns. So the second um, key takeaway for us is sustainability. Um, so if you can't, so like it says here, if you can't make new programs, see how you can renew or reformat your current or former programs to make them relevant again. Um, for example, uh, Museo Marino, who they were unable to have their conference, maritime conference, because of the pandemic. And instead, what they're doing is they're um, sharing their the um, docu documents or conference proceedings from previous conferences, which is actually really helpful for researchers um, in that field. Um, and then we also talked a bit about the idea of paid online content, um, which uh, came from um, the, the presentation of, of Mami Tataoka um, yesterday morning. So some, some of the museums that were part of the FGD were able to um, pursue this, such as Ayala Museum uh, and the CCP as well. So the, the advice was, if you're looking to create paid online content, start with programs that already exist, that are already known and, and supported by your audience. For example, in Ayala, they had the History Comes Alive um, sessions and, of course, uh, the Rush Hour concerts as well. And then in CCP, um, the Cinemalaya Festival and the Virgin Lamp Fest. So, of course, very, you know, this came out so many times in, in different forms, but collaboration. Um, so collaboration with suppliers of digital platforms, services, technologies, um, such as, you know, examples of this would be how the Museum Foundation of the Philippines partnered with Zalora, um, and also how the Makati Museum um, partnered with the Asia Pacific College in the development of an app. And they're also looking, you know, for, for possible collaborations for um, AR or VR content for the museum. Um, also collaboration with past exhibitors or past partners, like what the Vargas Museum did. Um, and of course, um, partnership with institutions or groups looking for cultural content, um, perhaps groups with advocacy um, and programs like that. And then of course, educational institutions. So we can tap the groups and schools that used to frequent our museums uh, via school tours. So that's something that's quite common to, to museums. No? Um, so maybe they can serve as audience or recipients of our educational materials or platform. Um, and also reconnect and review um, your stakeholders um, to, for opportunities for collaboration. So some new ideas uh, that came out from the discussion, create programs for a very specific audience instead of, um, you don't have to go wide, uh, but instead go deeper and have um, programs that are more specific. For example, um, the Chinatown Museum shared um, a program wherein they unexpectedly had a really, really high um, um, engagement and audience, uh, audience count for their program on um, blade, traditional um, blade. And so this is a very specific group, a very niche market, but uh, it is very rich in terms of audience and in terms of um, engagement, even go, going so far as having um, uh, audiences from abroad, like OSW, to you know, despite the time difference, attended um, their event, and also um, Ayala Museum has also been been doing this, and and continues to do this. And of course, be open to working with non-traditional partners for events that make use of specialized content. So, um, so 
this was also um, maybe as an example, this was also mentioned in, in yesterday's presentation um, uh, by Ms. Olbeth in the Spanish, uh, in the El Greco Museum. Um, so where she, she talked about the, the program where they did, where they highlighted their collection um, through using the um, themes of sports or, or you know, uh, the, the popular football um, uh, interest in football. So, okay. Uh, we also, uh, an idea also that came up was to look to and provide the younger generation space to engage and create. So this was actually uh, very common in the university museum that were part of the group um, and how um, the, the younger generation actually has a lot of you know creative ideas in terms of how to engage with the museum and how to engage with the collections of the museum. Um, and then also to think of disaster prepared, to think of the disaster preparedness framework of relief and rehabilitation. So this was shared by the Metro Bank Foundation. So going online being our relief response. So that's where, where we are now. Um, so maybe we, we should think about where or um, what our rehabilitation response will be in the future. So we also um, were able to talk about some of the challenges and how the museum uh, were able to overcome them. So we had museums with personnel um, that had no training or background in museum work. Um, and they were able to, um, so they were able to sort of augment this, this um, lack by consulting with other museum institutions or professionals regarding their program. Um, and they also shared how training, uh, they actually use training, um, uh, examples such as the Museum Summit to serve as references for their programs, and uh, which is highly beneficial in terms of having programs approved um, by their higher up. So, um, so these are for a lot of government museums, actually. Um, this is very relevant for us. Um, so museums that had no digital or online capacity, or rather employees that didn't have any um, very little digital online capacity, um, they were forced to learn. <laughs> That's pretty much what happened. No? Um, so how they became resilient, how they overcame this, this lack um, was really to learn and to um, experiment. So they were able to find uh, innovative ways to create um, improvised versions of online content and engagement. So um, examples such as the programs of the ASP Museum and also the uh, Maritime Museum. So sometimes we think about virtual exhibits as a necessity, um, but it really doesn't have to be. You know? There are other ways to to share your museum or to, you know, um, allow your audiences to be in your museum um, in different ways, no? not necessarily just through virtual exhibits, which can be quite difficult for, for uh, museums with, with smaller financial capacity. So some other challenges, um, some of the members of the group were part of museums that were either about to start um, creating a new building or about to rehabilitate their current museum. So of course, this was all halted, um, but uh, how, you know, something that, that came out was, this is actually an opportunity, you know? As bad as this whole um, current situation is, they can actually, um, in the future, when they are able to start again and, and to, make their museum or rehabilitate their museum. They can already incorporate um, and they can already prepare for, for uh, pandemics or you know similar situations or other forms of crisis that they were not aware of before, none of us were aware of before. Um, some of the other members of the group also um, were able to help, um, you know, 
help themselves by hiring professionals from other fields. So um, this is, of course, for those that have more uh, financial capacities. But um, even for those that, that don't, no? um, in the group, it was shared that you know, just a little, a little help actually goes a long way. So for, um, don't be afraid to work with professionals from other fields, especially um, like digital marketing, social media, um, online technical needs. Um, for CCP, we were able to get help in the archiving um, and digitization. I think it was Metro Bank Foundation that just got help for their social media, which was helpful in um, learning more about their audience. Okay. So other challenges um, the, and how they're able to overcome them. Of course, the challenge is, is for everyone, no? for the entire community, artists, frontliners, um, everyone. So some of the museums were able to support their community by um, pivoting from regular programs that wouldn't be relevant uh, in this time. And instead they create, they used, um, they created opportunities for the community. For example, um, GSIS Museum and Metro Bank Foundation um, canceled their competition for the year and instead were able to support artists the young artists that are actually their stakeholders and, and their uh, audience. So they're able to help these artists and also their, for GSIS Museum, they were able to help their own frontliners in the, in the museum, security staff, gallery staff, um, things like that. So some other ideas that were not discussed, or, uh, these are actually more of questions, things to think about. Um, so how do we use the online medium that is already um, constrained? So, you know, we're always, it, it's always, um, our idea of the museum is something that's very personal, something that's very tactile, very um, object and, and, and um, interaction based, no? So one um, idea or one, um, suggestion was that we can learn from or adapt technologies from the gaming industry um, who is ahead in creating an aesthetic experience as our broad, um, product. So other ideas, you know, how do we balance the physical and virtual programs and engagement? So we're actually looking at um, not just, you know, two types of programs, but also two types of audiences. <clears throat> And then we're also thinking about how do we make online engagement more personal, more human. Um, it, it can be very, you know, it can be very antiseptic seeing these things from the screen, um, being muted and told and, and talked to without, you know, the capacity to engage back and to share your, you know, your own thoughts. So how do we make um, the digital world more personal? and more, um, more human. Other, other idea, um, I don't think I was able to put it. So the creation, um, how uh, the pandemic actually opened new doors um, and created new revenue avenues. Um, so this is also part of how, um, how will we balance this hybrid of um, audiences, programs, and, and, and Revenue resources, you no. Know? Okay. And also, um, the other idea that that was not discussed was how the need to create responsible content. So responsible in terms of uh, the museum being a civic institution, a community institution, and also the, how to create responsible content, content that is responsible in terms of um, intellectual property, of course, and also museum ethics. No? Okay, and then some suggested initiatives or, or you know, uh, ideas that maybe our, our, our government or our, our legislate, legislators can look at. So assistance in collaborations, especially in fields or sectors or government departments related to education, tourism, and technology. So a support in terms of um, sharing our programs with with education with educators, and then uh, sharing our programs with. Although tourism is down now, but there's 
the, the local uh, domestic um, community of tourists um, is, is there. And also technology. So how can, um, you know, those that, that, that specialize and those that are well-versed in technology, how can they support cultural institutions? Even in the most basic ways uh, in the beginning would be a big help. Um, and also continued trainings and resource sharing programs among museums and partner institutions. So there's still, um, there's really still a gap among um, smaller museums and bigger museums, um, among museums that have a more specific audience and museums that have a more global national audience. So these trainings and resource sharing programs are, are very important um, within the community to help each other. Um, and to help sustain each other. No? And then, of course, streamline assistance program for medium staff to attend regional and international learning and networking opportunities. So some of the uh, members of the group um, mentioned how they're members of ICOM and, and the, how the ICOM conferences were helpful and CMAM also. Uh, so this um, assistance for museums to be able to attend these things regularly or participate in these groups regularly would um, be very beneficial for the community. Um, I, I think I end with that, but I also just want as a last note, maybe um, in June, AGMAM and, and the CCP did a museum community town hall. And I was, I was reflecting on the difference of the the discussion during June, in June, and um, and the discussion yesterday, and I'm I, it's very um, yeah, it makes me feel very optimistic and very hopeful because um, a lot of what was discussed yesterday were actually already solutions or programs that already in, uh, exist. In contrast to um, back in June, which if you think about it, was just four months ago, but um, it's the, the difference um, on, on, on the concerns and the issues and uh, even the, the, the energy or the, uh, the feelings of, of the museum workers uh, was so, is so different from, from back then and now. So I'm excited to see what the next four months will, will bring us or even the next four years. So thank you to everyone. Uh, thank you, Mass Museum. Thank you, Rika, and the participants of your group for such an extensive coverage of, uh, of uh, topics in your uh, discussions. So we value the feedback and the enthusiastic response from our participants and hope that these will all help us in understanding the steps we have to take to change in a time of upheaval. So we loved hearing from all of you and we would like to inform everyone that all of the suggestions and recommendations will be properly documented and so will the questions that have been raised in our Q&A box for this morning for all the F and, uh, FGD chairs. So uh, we go to the next part of the program and it is equally important to close this conference with a grasp of what transpired in the last four half day sessions in terms of knowledge sharing and introspections at the Manila Museum Summit 2020. The synthesis which will follow will be given by Ms. Sedi Vargas, who is the director of the Lopez Museum and Library, a Filipiniana institution representing 600 years of Philippine history and artistic heritage with over 31,000 volumes of rare books, manuscripts, and periodicals, as well as rare maps, photographs, Rizaliana, pre-colonial pottery, and fine art from the 19th century to the present day. The Lopez Museum and Library was founded in 1960 out of a deep and abiding love of country. Its mission was to be a cultural institution at the forefront of active scholarship through its commitment to the stewardship, preservation, enrichment, and promotion of its museum and library collections a mission that Ms. Sedi Vargas continues to carry out to this day through acquisitions, exhibitions, public programs, research services, collections management, and conservation. May I call on Ms. Sedi Vargas for the synthesis for this morning. 
Thank you, Tina. Am I on? Um, to the Honorable Lauren Legarda, Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives, Archi um, Architect Nico Manalo, Commission of, uh, Commissioner on Heritage, um, for Tina Colaico, President of Met Manila, and Danny Alvarez, President of AdMam. Thank you for this opportunity. It has been a truly enriching four days of discussion, thoughtful reflection, and imagination as we move to face the challenges and embark on the op opportunities of a changed world. Um, I, I, I dare say there was just so much learning to be taken away from the, this conference that um, it was difficult to find a way to organize all our thoughts and distill them into highlights. You know? So um, having said that, we'd like to invite um, everyone in this conference to make the most out of this uh, conference by revisiting the recorded material uh, so generously made available by the joint team of ADMA and the Metropolitan Museum of Manila on their social media platforms. And as such, that allows us to just limit the synthesis to focus on highlights taken from this, the talks of the conference speakers. Many of us have come to this summit seeking answers and guidance to questions we have been asking ourselves since the earlier part of the year, and perhaps even before, as we saw our world change drastically, and as we lived out this massive shift in the way we live and the way we work. Now, what does it really mean to be a museum at this reflexive moment? And how can we best use this moment to change and evolve our institutions to better serve our communities and our stakeholders, or as some museum directors refer to, our constituents. Moving on to the program, um, at the opening of the summit on the first day, we were welcomed by the executive director of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, um, Al Ryan Alejandre. And then the president of the Alliance of Greater Manila Museums, Danny Alvarez, and the president of the Metropolitan Museum of Manila, Tina Colaico. Tina grounded us in the vision of the summit to cultivate critical understanding on possible directions and, and solutions that museums are moving towards and the strategies implemented by the different institutions in adapting to these precarious times. So this week we have had the pleasure and honor to share in the perspectives and experiences of colleagues from all over the world in how their institutions were affected by the global pandemic and what thoughts provoked were provoked and what actions were taken, as well as what their visions are for the now and for the future in their roles as cultural institutions. We hope these conversations have been inspiring for all of you as it has been for us and for your institutions and creative spaces as we are called to transform in response to our own respective contexts within the global crisis, as well as within the frameworks of our individual ecosystems. As Director Alejandro of NCCA urged, we must reorient in a direction that responds to the needs of our community. Individual museums have no choice but to keep evaluating and redefining their roles, especially in these times. And he quotes Eric Zerudo in saying, museums will continue to exist and evolve as long as they continue to provide meaning to people and uplift their lives. Danny Alvarez at AdMam says the pandemic became a serious platform to evolve our programming. He shared that while the pro problem persists, it has also ushered closer collaborations uh, we rarely did in the past. And it has provided an opportunity for us to create collective result in creating a new normal for museums here and in the world over. So we'll move on to day one. 
Museums in Flux. Our first session presented Museums in Flux through the experiences of Dr. Eugene Tan at the National Gallery of Singapore and uh, the Singapore Art Museum. And uh, as well, we had Patrick Flores at the Jorge B. Vargas Museum and Filipiniana Research Center situated at the University of the Philippines. Now for Eugene Tan, art, he, um, his presentation was entitled Art Museums and Social Change. And in Singapore, as museums swiftly shifted online and decisively altered long established exhibition lineups, the crisis also prompted institutions to reflexively evaluate their roles and the systems within which they operate. And this was important. NGS and SAM focused on the local, strengthening its local relationships through a collaborative project in response to the pandemic called Novel Ways of Being, which they mounted in as short as four months. Eugene offered new outlooks with re regards to museum governance and to discussions surrounding the revisiting of the museum definition. He spoke about museums as inclusive and polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue, addressing conflicts and challenges of the present, and also to be able to contribute to upholding human dignity, social justice, global equality and planetary well-being. He shared the concept of the constituent museum that places relationships at the center of what museums do and renaming stakeholders as constituents as a political term that embodies a sense of agency. That was Eugene. Patrick Flores. Um, his presentation was entitled Manila Response, Investigating Fragilities and Repositioning Imagination. For his part, Patrick focused on the institution and institution work in the context of Manila and the nature of their engagements with the public. He brought to light the fragilities in the Manila response, implications of loss in revenue, threats to custodianship with difficulties in access, the skeletal workforce, and the transition into tra a transmedia environment when majority are ill-equipped for online engagement. And he also brought forth fundamental questions on what it means to be live or online. And, and these are questions that have yet to be explored. He cautioned that the default mode of transitioning online should not be seen as a substitute of actual museum content, but a space that demands its own language. But from fragilities come possibilities. Patrick calls for the strengthening of the immune system, a transformation that comes from within. He believes we must reconsider the exhibition modality curatorially, staking out a different ground. Develop multi-skilled museum teams, be more inclusive and reach out to more organic social initiatives, offering up space to collaborators to co-inhabit the museum domain. And this echoes the sentiments of Eugene. As well, he wants to recast the museum in relation to the ecology, literally the ecology around it, and to develop public art at a time when outdoors uh, proves safer. Patrick also calls for a more active pedagogy beyond exhibition guides. And he encourages um, museums to explore the essential spaces that exist within the curricula of the education system, where we can find ways to supplement and provide alternative learning modes for teachers, for students, and for parents. On, muse um, on, on the second day, um, the title of the symposium was uh, Facing Inevitable Change. Our second session, we explored facing inevitable change through the experiences of keynote speaker, Suhanya Rafael, director of M Museum in Hong Kong, and panelists, Zoe Butt, 
artistic director of the factory in Ho Chi Minh, Vietnam, and Gritya Gai Wong, artistic director of Jim Thompson Art Center in Bangkok. Three colleagues from three cities facing the crisis of the moment, of, uh, a crisis at the moment of uh, not just pandemic, but uh, social upheaval and political complexities, as well as an economic downturn. Now for Suhanya, she shared that the M Plus Museum is funded by a singular grant from the Hong Kong government as a public ordinance. And this we feel is a great example of the a government believing in art as a progressive agenda for sustainable cities. Their experience of the pandemic compounded with social upheaval use, usefully urged them to rethink, to return to thinking about the civic functions of museums, particularly the roles in both leadership and service, each informing the other to imbue their spaces with grace and with purpose. The amazing thing about M Plus is they, they are still an, a museum without a building. The building has yet to be finished. Now, without a building, M Plus began digital engagement early on, which was underscored by the fact that Asia is an early adopter of all things digital. Their programming has offered a dynamic range from in, interactive exhibitions where audiences collectively create content to hackathons that mine data of, of objects in the collection, and the M Plus Rover, a traveling creative studio for schools and communities that aims to build an informed museum base in Hong Kong, while the muse sorry, uh, museum base in Hong Kong. This while the museum is structured globally, it is also locally rooted. Their digital team is positioned within the curatorial department. For M Plus, it is important to reflect on the content being the driver of everything they do digitally. In the same way, we think carefully in the physical space, uh, fulfilling our civic duty, uh, fulfilling their civic duty to present research and, and thought and provoking and balanced content. Um, Suhanya talks about the work as layered and slow release. No? And she asks that we must always address um, these three important questions as museums. No? How do we change? What do we change? And why do we change? For Zoe, um, her, one of her keywords was responsibility, enabling artistic narratives. And she cautions of the dangers um, of, of uh, shifting online with not, with, with not, uh, with, uh, not enough reflective thought to the content of what we are shifting online. Um, Zoe's focus is on the artists and nurturing the relationship between artists and curator. As well, she also continues to say that the uh, in-person -pers experience is, is and will continue to be a critical aspect and uh, service to the community, especially compounded with the political complexities of censorship. Um, our, one of her main roles. Missing a page. Can you move that? For Gritya, Gawi Wong in Thailand, um, she heads the Jim Thompson Art Center, uh, which was severely affected by. COVID-19 and which reduced tourism in the country where they were highly dependent on. Um, with the threat to that to their survival, it presented for Gridia an, a, an opportunity to transition 
the art center and its activities towards local audiences uh, with a particular focus on youth and the artists. So in doing so, Gritia was able to fulfill a long time desire to refresh the curatorial perspective of the Jim Thompson Art Center collection by engaging with contemporary issues. Uh, she impressed us as well with her projects in strengthened collaborations with local, regional, and international bodies, artists, curators, and the nearby communities that surrounded the center to be able to create programs that accommodate the new normal. So uh, well, I think the strength of Grithia's pr presentation was on community collaboration. Now, moving on to day three, um, I just like to mention here, Ino Manalo cautioned everyone as he addressed us at the beginning of day three, for each of us to take the time and allow ourselves um, enough time to adjust and to adapt to the new ways of doing things. So I'd like to credit Ino Manalo for that. It was, it gave us a pause for thought. Now on the third day, we explored adaptive design and responsive solutions. And these through the experiences of our keynote speaker, Mami Kataoka, director of the Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, and panelists, Aaron Sito, director of Mashan in, in Jakarta, um, Elizabeth Thomas, assistant archivist at MoMA Art Archives in New York, and Isabel Olbes, assistant curator at Museo del Greco, in Toledo. Now we move to Mami Kataoka. And her title is Digital Program, is Digital Program a Magic Wand? Yeah. Now Mami situated her session in considering the fundamental purpose and essential role she envisions for the Mori Art Museum by revisiting the new ICOM definition. And this picks up on Eugene's discussion earlier this week. She underscored the importance of museums as a space for educational learning, community building, and inclusivity as opposed to democracy, and how it is imperative for the, the, that museums take responsibility for a sustainable future. In her overview of the global impact of COVID-19 to the museum sector, she noted that museums around the world have, have enhanced digital activities and have stepped up their pivotal role as educators. So too did Mori Art Museum. And as restrictions were lifting, her team began to question if digital programming could actually be a magic wand. She shared with us some useful tools and frameworks. And her team took the time to analyze digital for its challenges and opportunities and, and the relationship with the physical, articulating operational and value-based aspects to its offering, and that became a helpful guide towards designing their program. Mami also grew, drew attention to implications on sustainability, how digital, how the digital necessitates new skills, team, new, uh, new team members, or, re, or upskilled team members, programs, production costs, and at a time when resources are constrained, she as well asked us to think about how we must continue to explore new business models for museums. We move on to Aaron Sito of Machan, approaching programs and art education in a COVID landscape. In Jakarta, Aaron also shared his approach to his transition online. As a very young museum, just three years old, they had the advantage of flexibility and agility in their programming, as well as basic digital know-how and activities. At Matan, they considered the implication of unequal access, and this to them was important. No? Um, the, the implication of unequal access to internet, presenting meaningful content and building diverse audiences. This ultimately led them to not creating new content, but rather reformatting their existing educational programs to suit their different platforms. 
they took on a hybrid approach of the virtual and the physical, and this he emphasized. Aaron also discussed the importance of partnerships, not just in terms of sponsors, but also in local technologies. He shared, he shared a children's project that takes place in various public spaces all over the city. And, and he also talks about making use of both physical and digital through animation intervention. So for Aaron, it was hybrid programming that was core to them. Now, moving on, um, Elizabeth Thomas, relearning reference and responsive resources. Uh, over at the MoMA Art Archives, um, they have been closed now. So uh, she talks about how they had to make the most of this situation. Uh, Elizabeth focused on one particular program of the MoMA Art Archives, uh, the Reading Room a space where re researchers could have access to their archives, most of which have not yet been completely scanned. Uh, Pre-COVID, the reading room was always full with a long wait list, but with the closures, MoMA had to adapt by consolidating existing digitized materials across collections, archives, library, and research. And this is important in a way that she said would be useful and accessible to researchers. In parallel, Elizabeth and her team have been proactive in consulting an epidemiologist in preparing the physical spaces of the reading room for the day where she says in 2021, when physical visits will be allowed again. One takeaway that Elizabeth shared was rather than feeling pressured to create new content to engage with the public, it is more important to focus on what you already have and how you can better communicate with what is already available. The third speaker, third panelist for day three was Isabel Olbes, the relevance of museums during the pandemic. And for Isabel in Toledo, after museums were permitted to reopen, she had to battle with the residual fear on the part of their audience population. Visitor numbers continued and continue to remain low. With that, Isabel shared the range of activities that Museo del Greco had to take on in the digital space. They were swift to move online, offering an array of activities that expanded their audiences largely on social media platforms. But she notes that while they expanded their audience, however, um, they, um, some of their programs, which involved the, elder, um, the, more, the, the elderly demographic, uh, tended to get marginalized as their, uh, their senior citizens had difficulty going online. So this drew attention to the to what she felt were technological boundaries that exist in Spain. So given that she took note of having to develop new formats that would again include um, the, uh, the entire spectrum of the demographic of the museum. Today, we began um, with a keynote from Lauren Legarda uh, the Honor Honorable Lauren Legarda. And um, I just like to highlight her, uh, a bit, a portion of her statement where she says, despite the challenges, we learn to adapt. We learn to listen. We learn to become resilient. And through a can-do attitude and an environment that fosters collective support and understanding. If there is anyone still here from Lauren's staff, please convey to her the message that we continue to be inspired by all the work she does for Philippine arts and culture. Now we move on. Common threads that we saw um, all throughout the three days right, um, are as follows. It has been truly inspiring to see the efforts of our colleagues across the world 
in their effort to change and to respond to the call to action. We are grateful for the opportunity as well to meet as individual focus group discussions and to explore the subjects and the topics in greater and more depth. Now, despite our geographic distance, we have seen common threads in the way we have responded within our local context that have run through our reimagining of the now. There has been a strong call to reevaluate the fundamental role of the museum with discussions in our place as driver of social change and as civic leaders and institutions of public trust. We have seen the importance of collaboration and cohabitation on a local as well as international level. The digital has been the forefront of our discussions. And while the digital has become the default mode of transmission, we recognize that the physical cannot be replaced and that the digital is not altogether a magic wand, but a powerful tool that must be content driven in the same way as we approach the physical and one that can be harnessed in a hybrid form. Hybrid forms, sorry. The pandemic has been uh, also been a moment to look within, transform within, reevaluating how we tool our organizations to respond to crisis and arising needs, but also as well, looking deep into our collections to find our own narrative and our own value. In closing, yeah. As I close, I just like to say that never has the role of museums as public trust been more called to the fore than during these times. The challenge for us is to rise and to evolve new solutions within and beyond the limitations of this changing new world we continue explore. We continue to explore ways to work in. As the rapidly evolving state of technologies move to erase physical boundaries of geographies and politics, we begin to position ourselves in the happening of this great opportunity to rethink and reset. We push ourselves and to, to look at ourselves and the institutions we represent in a larger context and in a greater ecosystem. We allow ourselves to boldly stretch our horizons towards new ideas and possibilities and create deeper and more significant, significant meaningful interdisciplinary collaborations and partnerships. And to pick up from Sima, it is our responsibility as professionals in the global community for museums to confront and to overcome the situation through solidarity. And I end with reference to Patrick Flores. May every step we take be a step in the right direction. Thank you, good morning. And at this point, I would like to turn over the virtual floor to Ms. Tina Kolaiko. Tina? Thank you, Sedi, for helping us revisit, recall, and underscore common shared narratives from the packed program and compelling presentations of the entire conference. It really helped us, and uh, we hope that uh, we uh, we will be reminded of all that we learned and that we thankfully identified with uh, during the last four days. This brings us now to a close, final close of our four half day programs of the Manila Museum 2020. And we thank all our speakers for taking time to share their expertise, their experience, and multidimensional context, social, political, environmental, and COVID to enlighten us. We thank Mr. Ryan Alejandre, Mr. Danny Alvarez, Mr. Victorino Manalo, architect Miko Manalo, and Dr. Patrick Flores for gracing and facilitating our summit openings. And of course, we are in debt and thank again our partners, the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, 
the Alliance of Greater Manila Area Museums and our education partners, Museum Foundation of the Philippines and the De La Salle University Publishing House. And thank you to the MET team and technical staff who worked behind the scenes for the last few months and these last four days. Good job, everyone. Our most special thanks, of course, go to all of you, our audience and all participants of the Manila Museum Summit 2020. Your participation has been key to the success and the inspiration of this conference. May I also remind everyone that the official recordings will be available online by the end of November through the Metropolitan Museum of Manila YouTube channel, website, and Facebook page. And for those who stayed with us for the entire conference, official publication of the proceedings will be released in the next few months. So stay tuned to our social media and for updates. And so on this note, I would like to say, we hope we can continue with the conversations that we began and that we started during the summit as we move towards more transformative directions in each and for all our museums. So thank you once again for joining us for a call to transform Manila Museum Summit 2020.